Hello folks and welcome to today's webinar on farm composting fundamentals with Dr. Robert Rink. I'm Linda Wilsons Brolis of the Institute for Local Self-Reliance's Composting for Community Initiative and will be your hosts for this comp uh, webinar series. A quick shout out to a couple of my ILSR colleagues who are helping with the series. Uh, Sophia Jones will be providing technical support throughout this webinar and Clarissa Libertelli is a talented artist who is creating beautiful graphics for our composting initiative, including this image. So thank you for both. Thank you both for your help. Uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with our work, ILSR's Composting for Community Initiative is advancing composting to reduce waste, enhance local soils, create community development opportunities, and protect the climate. Our focus is to catalyze distributed food waste composting options that include home, community, and on-farm scales. We work to promote locally-based composting in a number of different ways. We convene a national community composter coalition and host networking and knowledge sharing opportunities, such as our cultivating community composting forums. We work one-on-one -on -one with communities through technical assistance and policy support. We produce reports and infographics. We host regular webinars and a podcast as well as a map that showcases initiatives around the country and policies and programs that are advancing composting at this scale. We also offer technical training through our Neighborhood Soil Rebuilders Composter Training Program. And for anyone that's interested in more training, we'll be releasing a self-paced online Community Composting 101, 101 course later this fall. This course covers composting fundamentals and the ins and outs of starting a community-based composting initiative. So stay, stay tuned. You can find all of these resources and more on our website. If you go to ilsr.org forward slash composting, you'll see a composting resources drop down menu on the right hand side of the screen. And from there, you can select reports, podcasts, webinars, and more. So, back to this webinar series. Uh, this series is being brought to you through our involvement with the Million Acre Challenge, which you'll be hearing more about in a moment. Uh, but our belief is that we can only achieve a regenerative food system if the nutrients from our food scraps and other organic materials are cycled back into our soils. And farmers and other folks that care for the soil are ideal stewards of this process. There are many other benefits of composting and compost use, which is exactly what the series will explore. As you can see here, this is the first of the series in which Dr. Robert Rink will cover the variety of methods and key considerations for establishing a composting site on a farm. Next up, on September 14th, we'll hear from Ellen Polyshuk, who was a farmer at Potomac Vegetable Farms in Virginia for 25 years. She'll discuss integrating composting into your farming business and how to use it as a tool for profit and growth. Check out the rest of the lineup here and on our website. But now, let's get to know each other a little bit with some interactive polls. So you'll be able to Participate in the poll by going to the GoToWebinar control panel, which should be on your screen. So first question, where are you participating from? Northeastern US, Southern US, Midwestern US, Western US, or outside of the US? Give you all just a few more seconds. All right. Let's see the results. So primarily Northeastern US, but a pretty good spread. Even a few folks from outside of the US. So thanks for joining us. Next question. Are you composting? Yes, you're already composting. No, but you're interested in starting. No, you're interested in supporting others in composting or other. Just a couple more seconds. So large majority are already composting. Awesome, welcome. Uh, hopefully we'll be providing you some great info to improve your composting. And for those of you that have not started yet, uh, hopefully we'll be giving you some inspiration to do so. Last question for now. What best describes your affiliation? And I'm sorry, they only give you five options, so I had to condense some of the options, but 
Are you a farmer, a composter, a farm service provider, and then either a researcher, government, or nonprofit uh, person, and then other business or other? Right, just a couple more seconds. All right, let's check out the results. So a good chunk are farmers, welcome. But there's also a lot of either researcher, government, or nonprofit, and a few other composters and other business. So welcome to everyone. Getting back to my presentation. All righty. Okay. So uh, at this point, I would love to hand things over to my colleague at the Million Acre Challenge, Amanda Cather, who is the project director of the Million Acre Challenge. So Amanda, Amanda if you're on the line, you can unmute yourself. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you, Linda, very much. Um, yes, as Linda said, my name is Amanda Cather, and I'm the project director for the Million Acre Challenge. We are uh, a collaborative project of five, six founding partners and many more collaborators and farmers working to bring one million acres of healthy soils to the Chesapeake region and to help catalyze the national movement towards regenerative agriculture. And we are very grateful to be able to help sponsor this workshop series with ILSR, who is one of those six founding partners. Uh, we at the Million Acre Challenge work towards regenerative agriculture using a combination of five levers, which are represented in our five working groups. And you can see them here on this slide. Um, farmer engagement, scientific research, creating a business case for regeneration, working on state and local policy and also participating in uh, national discussions about state and local policy and creating consumer demand for regenerative agriculture via public outreach. So, and of course, as all of you know, because you're here today, on-farm composting is deeply important and woven through all of these layers um, and these working groups with the potential to increase farm profitability, provide significant ecosystem services, including potentially reductions in greenhouse gas emissions, and contribute to farm resilience in the face of a changing climate, which we feel every single day, at least on my farm. Um, so as you all know, composting this is our mission uh, and our vision for the Million Acre Challenge. And composting is both critically important to this mission and vision and also scientifically and technically complex, which is why the Million Acre Challenge partners are so excited to be a part of the series, bringing together regional and national experts on on-farm composting. Um, I would encourage you to find out more about the Million Acre Challenge on the web at millionacrechallenge.org or on our social media feeds. We'd love to connect with all of you. Um, but for now, I think we should get on with what you came for. Oh, this, these are our team, our six founding partners, and we're grateful to all of them for their support today and always. And yeah, let's get on with the webinar. Awesome. Thanks, Amanda. All right. So, uh, before we begin our feature presentation, just a few house housekeeping notes. Um, everyone is in listen-only mode. Um, we should have about 20 or so minutes at the end of the webinar for questions, but go ahead and enter your questions as they come up into the GoToWebinar control panel box on your screen. Uh, we'll be monitoring them there. Um, this webinar is being recorded and a copy will be sent to you as a registrant of the webinar. Um, there's also a handout of the presentation available um, as an attachment. Um, if you are a farmer who was not, who could not find the uh, discount code and ended up, ended up paying for the webinar, please let us know either in the chat here or by emailing us and we will uh, get you refunded. So just let us know. But without further ado, um, it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker. Uh, Dr. Robert Rink has been researching and teaching about processing of agricultural and other organic materials for over 30 years. He's an internationally renowned expert who has authored numerous publications, 
including the original on-farm composting handbook and its pending sequel, The Composting Handbook. He is an agricultural engineer and is a regular instructor for composting training schools and workshops, both nationally and internationally. So without further ado, take it away, Dr. Rank. Oh, thank you, Linda. Uh, let me share my webcam briefly. I know you don't want to look at me the whole time, but that's what I look like. I just wanted to show you that I'm here. I'm not a robot or a chicken or Linda changing her voice. Um, and I'm very happy to be here. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to uh, talk about on-farm composting because I think it's important. So let me get rid of myself and start showing you my slides, which are a great deal more interesting. Here, get started there. Can everybody see that and hear me? Linda? Yep, looks good, sounds good. Okay, great, thanks. So um, I'm gonna talk about the fundamentals of on farm composting and composting generally. Um, we have an hour, and that's not a lot of time to cover the waterfront. So I'm going to do this uh, more or less as best as I can. Um, I took a look at your questions that you put in ahead of time. I think that I'll ask, I will answer a bunch of those um, and some I will only touch upon. And then others, uh, you'll have to wait for the other webinar speakers who will address them in a bit more detail. But uh, I'll be glad to answer questions at the end uh, to get into more detail as needed. Okay, so uh, what am I gonna be talking about today? Uh, why on-farm composting matters. I'll give a brief overview of the process and mostly by example of what uh, other farms have done, show you the methods and equipments involved in composting. Again, it's just a sample given the time we have. Um, we'll talk about site requirements and env environmental factors, but here's where the more or less comes in. I'll be spending more time on the, the methods and equipment than I will be on site requirements and environmental factors. Okay. What I won't be talking about in much depth at all is composting farm mortalities or vermicomposting on the farm. Uh, Community-based composting uh, and the compost how to use it, um, how to make the quality you want, how to sell it, and won't be getting much into economics, but again, I'll be glad to answer questions at the end. And in general, details and specifics will be missing because of the time. But if you're interested in at least three of those topics, uh, composting animal mortalities, community scale composting, and vermicomposting, there are some great references out there for you to gain more information. Um, the one on the upper left-hand side is available from the online from the Cornell, Cornell Waste Management Institute. I think it's free. And the other two are books, uh, well worth the investment. And you'll be hearing from James McSweeney later on in the program. And then, of course, this has been my big project, is taking the on-farm composting handbook, expanding it and updating it, and um, creating a new handbook. And, this is just about done. Uh, the chapters are with the publisher. They think they could get it out by the end of the year. Let's have our fingers crossed, um, especially before Christmas. I'm sure it would make a great Christmas gift. Um, and that's the introduction. So what does composting do? In a nutshell, basically composting takes raw feedstocks like this and many other types types of feedstocks. These are, happen to be cold potatoes from um, a farm in uh, central Washington and turns it into this from something that's difficult to handle, doesn't have an immediate use to something that's a lot more that's easier to handle and does have a good use. So this compost being spread here was made from these very same, well not the very same, but made from cold potatoes also and other pack and shed calls, uh, along with dairy manure, to become an input for this particular farm. So why does on-farm composting matter? Well, basically because composting and compost matter. They play important roles, not only in agriculture, but in society in general. 
and composting and compost on farms. Um, next, farms are an excellent place for both. So if we can take do a lot of the composting on farms, and farms can accept a lot of the compost that's made, um, we are solving a great number of problems. So on-farm composting matters a lot because compost can compost. Uh, the first reason, the probably the most important reason that composting matters is that is the compost, which can greatly improve soils and improve plant health. Again, you're going to get a another uh, webinar series, uh, presentation on this, so I'm not going to go into any depth. But in a picture, this is what composting does for the soil. And in words, from the same um, from Dr. Gann, um, these are some of the benefits of compost to soils and plants. Particularly on farms, the composting also has a place in manure management. Increasingly. Um, farmers have uh, some difficulty handling manure as animal numbers increase and land doesn't necessarily increase along with it. Um, it's easy to get in a situation where there's too many nutrients for the farm. Uh, manure can be difficult to handle. Um, it has more volume, more weight, more water than compost, and that could equate to more trips to distant fields to apply it uh, in an agronomic manner. Um, whereas compost stores well, it doesn't have to be applied right away, uh, and it's exportable. And it's exportable because it handles easily, and therefore more people want it, so more people willing to take it from the farm, and even people willing to pay for it. So potentially, depending upon the farm situation, um, compost can, can be a benefit to manure management. Okay, and then there's the potential for added revenue for the farm. Revenue could come from uh, making compost by selling the compost that's made or by being paid to take uh, waste and residues from off the farm. Okay. So this picture shows both. This is not a farm. This is a company that takes advantage of both of those revenue streams. They sell compost, they charge to bring in green. In farm situation, that could be difficult. Um, in some jurisdictions, if you do either of these on the farm, that is, sell compost made from waste from off the farm or sell compost at all, or take in off-farm waste, uh, that jurisdiction may say, well, you're no longer a farm. That's not always the case. It depends upon the state in particular. In some cases, you could do both and still retain uh, your your farm classification. In other cases, uh, you could do one or the other, but not both. And that's usually the common case. So you can sell compost um, from feedstocks that you collect on the farm, or even off farm feedstocks, and you're still a farm. Or you can bring in green waste, but not sell the compost, uh, and you'd be still a farm. Usually, it's the bringing in off farm materials that's a little more allowed and where the revenues uh, are more easily captured in this case. It takes a pretty good effort sometimes to sell. Uh, and bringing in off-farm waste, um, there are a lot of people who might be looking for a home for their waste and residues, uh, and farms are a good place to bring it. It just brings some cautions. Okay, and we'll talk about that. One of the reasons that route is a little easier is because um, we recognize that it's not so easy to get rid of waste anymore, particularly organic waste. We don't want to put them in landfill. And a good number of states, and this slides from my colleague Matt Cotton, a uh, good number of states uh, starting 40 years ago started banning yard trimmings from landfills. That's when we had a landfill crisis. And more recently, um, a number of states are beginning to ban uh, food waste, or they'll call it organ or organics generally. New York State being the most recent to um, implement a statewide ban uh, for food waste. And that presents opportunities uh, for farm to take in these materials and pay get paid to do that. Um, so, you know, food is the nutrient, and it's because 
of its impact on climate change. So when food is brought to the landfill, even with a landfill with a, a, um, a methane collection system, it still makes methane and that methane escapes. And that's because food breaks down so quickly at the landfill face. Um, it, it emits its methane before uh, methane collection system has a, tech, has a chance to, to start collecting. And methane is a potent greenhouse gas. And thirdly, there's better options for food than, than growing at the landfill. First being um, trying to make use of it uh, as food for people and then food for animals. And then finally, it can be composted or sent to an anaerobic digestion facility. Um, but all of those are better than the land. So the push to start taking food waste out of the landfill, though, is mostly due to climate change. Okay. And then compost has some benefits as far as uh, carbon sequestration, sticking to the climate change thing. Um, this slide is from uh, Jeff Greek. I think I saw Jeff's name on, uh, on the list. Um, so this is where compost has been used on uh, rangeland or pasture in uh, Marin County in California. And uh, the research has shown some pretty good benefits. So here's just an example. Um, well, let me go back to that previous slide. The squares indicate where cows are grazing on this land that have received compost. And they seem to be preferentially grazing on those plots where compost was uh, used versus um, the rest of the uh, pasture land where there's no compost. Um, but more directly, this is a slide of the soil organic matter uh, several years after a single application of compost was made. And so the red bars are the plots that had compost. And you can see they generally show higher soil organic matter compared to control plots which didn't receive compost. But the big story here is that this is not an annual application of compost that that the soil organic matter is responding to, but a single application that happened in two, 2008. So that one application had many years of impact and this project is still going on. Uh, so sticking with the climate change theme, um, another colleague of mine, uh, Jane Gilbert led a team that looked that tried to put a number on the that carbon sequestration value of compost alone. It's available in this publication from the ISWA. Again, I think that's free. Uh, and they placed a value on it just for carbon sequestration of five to nine dollars per fresh ton of compost. That's of the compost and not of the waste, meaning it's not a dry ton of compost, it's a wet ton. Of so there's some value there. So all good. Great. On farm composting will great. What's the downside? Well, it takes work. It takes work, it takes time. You gotta put money in. You need space to do it, investment in equipment, investment in land maybe, investment in controls. Um, so it's not free. And the hope is that it'll pay for itself either in uh, the value of the compost or the service you provide. Um, but it does take an effort. And then there are also the hassles related to mostly odors. Okay, um, so this is a sign I came across uh, where a composter was trying to expand a farm composter uh, into new land, and there was lots of neighborhood opposition to that, mostly because there had been odor issues before. Um, so composting isn't welcomed by everyone. It's generally welcomed by everyone until it get, comes to your neighborhood, and then there's an issue. These things are controllable. Um, I shouldn't say controllable. These things can be made better by a number of practices that composters can do, including uh, becoming more active and participating in the neighborhood. Um, but this is one of the things that any composter may face, even on a farm. But the sign's wrong. The sign should say this. Say yes, composting. And it is farming. It's very compatible with farming. It's consistent with farming. In fact, I would even argue that composting is inherently farming um, by its nature because you're, you're using uh, natural processes to produce a product um, that, and you're husbanding microorganisms to do that. 
and um, it's a radical idea, but I would suggest, yes, if you're composting, you're automatically applying. So um, that's the why. Let's look at the how, the composting process, really far of the how. I'm going to go through this fairly quickly because uh, a lot of you are composters already and know much of this. Uh, these are the ins and outs of the composting process, the direction of the arrow show whether it's an in or out. Basically, what we put in are the feedstocks. The microorganisms are there, although some people add special microorganisms to do that. The oxygen comes in on its own, uh, although, again, in some cases, they have to make an effort to do that, and the water as well. And the outputs are water vapor, carbon dioxide, and heat, all good things. And then there are some bad things, odors and other gases that people might object to. But the main output is compost, which is a value added product of the feedstocks that go in. And here's the trend of a compost, uh, of a composting process. Okay, many of you have seen this graph or something like it. Temperature tells a story of what's going on during compost. And temperature does that by, by the fact that it's a direct result of the decomposition that's taking place of the microbials act. So as heat is released from the decomposition, the temperature goes up and uh, accumulates and heats up the pile. And it, it basically reflects how much heat is being generated. Okay. So there are several stages. This accelerating stage in the begin, beginning when temperature heats up quickly, this long stage um, hot and rapid composting where we spend most of our time. Um, and then a final stage where compost cures and matures. And, and that's reflected by the lower temperatures that's going on. There's a few other temperatures to uh, take note of. One is the, the, the point at which a mesophilic process turns into a thermophilic process. This is not a very important point. It's just, an academic matter really and it's not it's not a fixed point anyway then the microorganisms cells don't see this line and don't know where it happens uh, it's just that thermophilic microorganisms can uh, withstand higher temperatures and they do most of the work through most of the composting process and mesophilic microorganisms don't they can play different roles um, so mesophilic for example mesophilic microorganisms uh, are more active in that curing and maturing stage, and their mesophilic, some mesophilic organisms are the ones that turn ammonia into nitrite and nitrate. So that transformation happens. But basically, we're in a thermic range. A more important line is this one, and that's the pathogen threshold, um, or at least that's the pathogen, the standard pathogen threshold. Regulations often dictate that pathogens and weed seeds have to be killed, depending upon the peat stocks and the situation. You have to make sure you follow the pathogen reduction process. And in the US, we call that uh, process to further process to further reduce pathogens, PFRP. Uh, outside of the US, we may just call it sanitization or 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 homogenization, um, but it generally happens, it's generally defined at this 55 degrees Celsius or 100, which is 101 degrees Fahrenheit at this point. So normally the regulations say when they apply is that you have to hold the composting materials above that temperature for a certain amount of time. For static processes and processes that are contained in the vessel, that's 55 degrees C, uh, for three days. Uh, for windrows, which are smaller, have a more a larger surface area and they get turned, it's actually 15 degrees and it has to be turned five times within that uh, time span, within that 15 degree time span. Or it has to be turned five times and, uh, and during the five times it stays above 55 degrees. Now, outside of the US, some regulations require, have raised this pathogen uh, threshold to 60 degrees and even 65 degrees in some places, which can be a challenge depending upon the heat storm. But basically, it's 55. So that's an important one. And that's also where wheat seeds are killed. 
Actually, most wheat seeds are killed below, well below 55, um, 131. Even at, at 120 degrees Fahrenheit, most wheat seeds begin to die. Um, but if you want to be sure, um, the higher the temperature, the better. And, and keeping the pile moist during those hot temperatures also helps to destroy some wheat seeds. Okay, just as a clarification, those dips on this curve really represent when, when the pile is maybe turned or watered. It's an immediate loss of temperature, but it recovers. Okay, and then there's a securing stage at the end where uh, the process continues. It's decom decomposition is still going on, but it's at a much slower pace. So um, this curing pile doesn't require the same attention um, or effort as the active composting stage. It's an important stage. A lot of things happen in curing. The temperature is lower. Again, those mesophilic organisms, fungi begin to come back uh, in greater numbers during curing and continue uh, turning this partially composted material into compost. Um, so it's an important stage, but it requires less attention and actually less time as well. So here are some of the key factors that determine how well composting occurs. Um, it needs to be moist. The organisms live in, in the moisture within the compost pile in the 50 to 60 percent moisture content um, seems to be uh, the optimal. It has to have a good mix of nutrients, particularly carbon and nitrogen. I recommend higher carbon and nitrogen ratios um than most people do if you go by the book we're talking about 25 to 1 or slightly larger i like to say more because the more higher the carbon to nitrogen ratio is the better that a pile of windrow tends to aerate and also this it slows down the process a bit okay? as, as the carbon nitrogen ratio raises above 25 to 1 the process slows down um, if you're in a hurry, that's not good. But if you're not in a hurry and um, want a little more leeway to manage the process properly, having a higher C-to-N ratio isn't bad. Um, however, the downside of high C-to-N ratios is that carries over into the compost to make it a compost high C-to-N ratio. And th that does have some limits. Bulk density refers to um, the weight per unit volume. Um, but it turns out the bulk density is a pretty good indicator of the process conditions generally, both the moisture um, condition and how well, how much pore space there is, open pore space there is. And so um, it's a good indicator of how well a pile will aerate, whether you're using fans or passive aeration, and should stay below 1,000 pounds per cubic yard. And, and temperatures, um, again, try to stay in that ideal range above where the pathogens are killed, but below where the microorganisms be, seem to suffer, and that seems to be about 160. Okay, there's some other parameters that are important, but um, they're not as important in terms of control, what we do. Oxygen is clearly important, but in most cases, composters do not spend a lot of time measuring it. Uh, they use temperature as an indirect gauge instead. So let's take a look a little bit more at each one of these. Again, uh, there's, a, there's a range where, moisture, where their moisture content is just right. You get a little higher, it's too wet, materials get heavy, pores get filled with water, it can't aerate. And then a point where the process slows down because there's not enough water for the microorganism to inhabit. Uh, so that sweet, pot, sweet spot is, is above 50, below 65. You get below 35, it's way too dry, and nothing will happen, and it hurts them. Um, so the challenge in composting is, depending upon where you're composting, where you are, is keeping it moist. In arid regions, this is a constant struggle, because it's not easy to add moisture evenly uh, throughout a pile. Um, a good way to do it is to add moisture while you're turning, um, but that means you've got to carry water with, 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 along with you as you're doing the turn. So keeping it moist is important. 
Um, keeping it dry, keeping from getting too moist is also important. So here's pictures of these fabric covers that are used to keep out precipitation. This is not necessarily the only way, but it's a good picture of, um, of an attempt to keep it from uh, getting too moist. Really the best way or the most common way is to uh, turn it to try to drive off some of that moisture, especially on a summer day. Um, but in some places, keeping it from getting too dry is the challenge. In other places, keeping it from getting too moist. Oxygen really is the key to composting. You know, that's what the, we want aerobic oxygen rich conditions in the pile because we want aerobic microorganisms to do the work because those are the ones who do it most quickly, most completely, and with the least amount of odors. Um, 5% is considered a minimum, that's a bare minimum, but generally the goal is to try to keep it above that. Um, and normally we don't monitor room oxygen. Um, again, we let temperature tell the story. Um, and then we just aerate as best we can. Um, and oxygen is delivered to the, to the pile by aeration. And there's two primary ways of aeration. Uh, windrows and passive piles aerate by passive aeration. Basically what's happening is inside the pile, it's a little warmer than it is in the environment around. And that warm air uh, leaves the pile. Uh, and then it creates a vacuum and cool air, cool oxygen rich air replaces it. Uh, diffusion is another way that oxygen gets in and CO2 gets out of the pile, but diffusion is a very slow process. Relying on that doesn't provide nearly as much air and oxygen as uh, these passive air movements. And these passive air movements are very dependent on, first of all, generating temperatures inside, warmer temperatures inside, but also uh, how easy the air can move in and out. And that has to do with the airspace within the pile, the bulk density. Uh, we can air it with more certainty by putting a fan and some ductwork within the pile um, and using pressure to blow air into the middle of it and then hopefully it's distributed evenly and the cool fresh oxygen rich air goes in the middle, cools the pile, keeps it from getting too hot and also brings in oxygen. The primary way of using forced aeration, especially on farm on farms, it's a method called the aerated static pile method. This would be a diagram of that. Aerated static piles do not get turned on a regular basis. Um, they may get turned occasionally, um, once or twice, and the aeration system has to be um, taken out, disassembled, and reassembled when, when returning, uh, or it's built into a floor and you can turn on top of that. Um, but this is a picture of the air stack. We'd also suck air out of the pile, change the direction of these arrows. Um, that would be used when we're a little bit more concerned about odors, um, because you concentrate the exhaust from the pile at one point, and that can be directed to an odor treatment system like biofilter. But positive pressure uh, systems like the one shown here um, are generally easier to handle. They use less energy, and um, they are the most common. I'll show you some pictures of these later. Okay, so I haven't talked about turning yet in regard to aeration. So what does turning do? Well, it doesn't really aerate it, at least not in the long term. Here, here are the functions that turning does. It does charge the pile with fresh air and oxygen. But that oxygen is, lasts only briefly, an hour, maybe two hours at best. So turning is not really, does not really provide aeration. What it does is it releases the gases that are trapped inside, it mixes things up so it redistributes nutrients and moisture, it breaks up air channels, it improves consistency. In some cases it does fluff, so it reduces the density of the material in the windrow, uh, making it easier for air to flow in and and out uh, by passive aeration. But in other cases, it doesn't. In other cases, it shreds particles apart and after turning, you end up with a, uh, a windrow that's less dense than before. 
So it depends on the situation. And turning breaks apart comes. In. So that's primarily what it does. And because of that, it generally invigorates the process. Always see a burst of activity after turning. Part of it's that oxygen that it builds in for a short time, but a lot of it are those other you know, mixing and turning. Um, I kind of compare it to making a stir fry on the stove and you're actually doing the stirring to distribute things around the pan a little bit more and uh, make things more even. That's what turning does. You can envision what's going on within the composting pile at a microscopic level and it might look something like this. Um, you've got these particles of biodegradable organic materials, um, they're breaking down and this moisture film kind of clings to the edge of it. And that's where the microorganisms are in that moisture film. And they're breaking down the particle from its surfaces outward. And the nutrients tend to dissolve into that moisture film and the microorganisms um, uh, gain the nutrients from the moisture film. Um, where's the oxygen? Well, immediately most of the oxygen is in those pore spaces that you're seeing on the left. And it has the oxygen has to diffuse into the moisture film to get to the microorganisms. Um, so it's important to remain to maintain a pile that has those pore spaces. We call them free air spaces because they're not filled with moisture, um, so that the oxygen can first get into the interior pile in order to diffuse into the, the liquid film. We want to avoid the situation on the right as much as possible where particles are clumped together. There's no free air space um, and no, and it's more difficult for oxygen to diffuse into that moisture. So we want to we want to encourage the left hand side of this diagram rather than the right. And what determines that in part is the bulk density. Bulk density reflects whether we have these particles all packed together uh, without free air space and a lot of moisture or whether it's fluffier. And so uh, we shoot for a bulk density in that 700 to 1,000 pounds per cubic yard area. And it's pretty easy to measure bulk density. All you need is a pail and a scale. There's a standard method of doing this by filling a pail a certain amount, dropping it from a certain height, keep filling the pail and keep dropping it until you get to a certain point. And then you weigh it and you've got the weight for a five gallon pail and you can convert that to pounds per cubic yard. It's easy to do. The reason I show this slide is because bulk density is an easy and, and very general measure to determine um, the conditions in the pile. And it's a good one. Pile height, it's often a question, uh, what's the right height for a pile? I like to measure um, pile heights in Calvin's. It's, this is Calvin you see in the picture. So this pile is maybe two Calvin's high. Uh, the reason I measure in Calvin's is because to me feet is a bit too imprecise when we're talking about pile height. What's the difference between a three foot high or four foot high pile or even six and eight foot high pile? Not much. So I like to refer to pile heights in Calvin's. Um, and so in general, maybe three Calvin's is a max. And if, if you want to do the conversion, Calvin's about six foot tall. That's the point. We don't need to be too precise. Uh, as one of my colleagues says, there's really no decimal points in compost. Um, but in regard to windrow size, maybe the best rule of thumb to go by is you have to drive onto a pile um, to get it to the top to stack it, then it's too big. But generally, the pile size is a term determined by the equipment you're going to be used to make the compost. If you're using windrow turners, the windrow turners are going to dictate the pile. But if you're using loaders, you can go a lot higher. And so this rule of thumb of uh, not driving on the pile to determine the pile height is the way to go. Next factor is feedstocks. Feedstock all, brings all of its character to the compost pile. And basically, feedstocks are what determine how the composting process is going to go. How it's going to behave, and feedstocks primarily determine the character of the compost itself. 
So if you have nutrient-rich feedstocks, you'll make nutrient-rich milk. If you have nutrient-poor feedstocks, you'll make nutrient-poor milk. Uh, woody feedstocks make woody milk. You get it. And feedstocks with contaminants will make compost. You can do things to improve that. Really, it's the feedstocks that determine. Sometimes you get feedstocks that are adequately balanced, so compost without doing anything, like these art trimmings on the right. Sometimes not, like this manure on the bottom left. Um, that needs some amending before it will compost well. Okay. And so what we do is we mix ingredients together, ingredients that don't have enough nitrogen, with ingredients that, ingredients that have too much nitrogen, ingredients that are wet, with ingredients that are dry to try to get Get these conditions I talked about earlier. And brush and leaves and grass and food are good examples. In, uh, in the, the backyard composting world, we talk about these low nitrogen materials as brown and these high nitrogen materials as greens. And the high nitrogen materials most often are wet, not always, but most often are wet, and the, the low nitrogen materials most often are dry. Combining them together with the right C to N ratio also tends to improve the moisture status. Here's an example of a composting recipe um, on a farm using fish waste. Uh, James McSweeney is going to talk about this a lot more, so I'm not going to go into it. There's examples of nitrogen rich feedstocks, uh, poultry manure, fish waste, food, grass, and you want to combine those with nitrogen poor feedstocks like uh, fall leaves straw, uh, horse bedding, brush, things of that nature. I crossed out carbon and put in nitrogen poor because uh, we often refer to things as, as carbon sources, but really carbon's in everything, even in the nitrogen, high nitrogen materials, everything, all organic material has roughly the same amount of carbon. It's the nitrogen that determines whether it's a carbon source or not, really. Okay, the next factor is temperature. Talked a lot about that already. Um, there's a temperature range that's ideal for composting. It tends to be between 120 and um, 140 degrees Fahrenheit, but at 160, it doesn't suffer much. Above 160, it starts to suffer more. But we want to get to that 130 uh, level to uh, kill pathogens and wheat seeds. Okay. The thing about temperature, the most important thing about temperature in the composting process is that you can consider temperature composting as a model. Talked about this already. The release of heat is the direct result of the process, so watching the temperature reflects the release of heat and the microbial activity. So it's the most important parameter to monitor to tell us what's going on. And then time is the last step. It takes some time. You can't really rush the microorganisms too much. Now, usually we need at least about a month to make stable compost for general use. Um, more often it takes two to six months. And if you're relaxed about it or have tough feedstocks, it could take a year or more. And it depends on the feedstocks, how you intend to use the compost and how stability, stable it needs to be when you're using it, the methods as well. And it's really the management. Once you determine, it's the, it's the management more so than the method that determines whether you're not going to stay. And then you watch all these things to make sure it's going. And the sensory observations include odors. Okay, let's move on to equipment and methods. I'm going to use examples to go over different farm scale composting. So the most common is turned windrow, and that's what you'll see the most pictures of, and that's probably what you have in your mind when you think about composting, a long, narrow pile of uh, material that gets turned and churned every now and then. The main advantage of windrows is that it's simple, it's easily started and managed, anybody can do it. Anybody almost can build a windrow in their backyard pile, in their backyard and start composting or in the back 40 really don't need any special equipment. And that's the reason most people do. So here's an example of a farm who compost dairy cattle manure with some waste from grocery stores and, and some from food processing facility. 
for all vegetables in that case. And they simply make windrows with um, a skid steel lo loader that has an oversized bucket. Um, makes the windrows and turned every now and then. Okay, fairly simple. When the turn, that's really a, 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 a composter specific situation uh, and preference, um, but it doesn't require much more than a skid steer in this case. Um, there are some trucks involved, probably to move materials around the farm, but so this is all it involves. Here's another example. This is a horse farm um, that's using it, adding its horse manure to yard trimmings um, that it was getting from the municipalities. I don't think this operation, uh, I think it's closed down years ago. But basically, just to show you how they manage it, they use an excavator as their primary uh, turning device. Just every now and then move piles, put the bucket on an excavator, and they also use that to build the piles. Their, their main objective here was to compost the yard trimmings. Um, the horse farm was basically just an excuse to have an off farm. When you're composting yard trimmings, um, you're going to need to grind them up if you're taking any brush. And then, because there'll be a lot of wood still in it, when you're done composting, you'll need to screen out the uh, oversized materials. And in this case, they use the trauma screen. Probably hired out both sides of that. They hired in the grinder and hired out screen from time to time. Uh, here's another example of a windrow uh, turned operation on, in this case, the farm compost manure with yard trimmings and also some food processing waste. Um, and they turn, they build their windrows with a loader and turn them with this tractor power turner. The tractor uh, powers a turner both by pulling it, um, it's used for travel, and also through the, the PTO, uh, it drives the turner itself. So, and you can see they have fairly wide aisles between windrows to accommodate the tractor on both sides. Although um, you could actually stack two windrows closer together, so you don't need an aisle for the tractor on both sides. This is still that same farm. Um, they do make an effort to water their windrows. Their windrow turner has nozzles on it, so they can add water while they're uh, turning. And they have a tank wagon that they pull behind the turner, uh, which feeds the nozzles on the turner. Because they're handling our trimmings, this uh, farm also does some screening. They own the satellite screen they use to make. Dr. Rink? Yes. Uh just wanted to flag we have about 20 minutes left. 20 minutes. 20 minutes for my part for the presentation? Before yeah, questions. just uh, okay. to, leave, to leave time for Q&A. Okay, thank you, Linda. Um, again, this is another example of a farm that uses a window turner, tractor-assisted window turner. In this case, it's uh, uh, this farm's in Idaho, so their dairy manure is from the outside lots, and it tends to be dry. Um, they add some bedding to it to improve the, the composting situation. And they have a, their turner has, needs a tractor for travel, but it has its own engine to power the turner itself. Um, they have a, a truck mounted manure spreader um, that they build the piles with. Um, and because it's in Idaho, because the material starts out dry and they get very little precipitation. Um, they add water regularly and they use a tractor tilled water wagon to do that. Right after they do this, it will come through with the turner and mix that water into the window. Okay, so those are turn systems. Um, the other is area static piles. Here's a diagram of that. Um, area static piles more reliably keep um, the contents of the pile aerobic because we're forcing air into there. It also provides a level of temperature control using that air um, to cool down the pile. So you get more process control in an area static pile. Another important advantage of it is you taking all these materials that might have been in a windrow and pulling them all together into a wider, higher pile. 
So we have a lower area of requirement. That means if you need to cover it, it's more easily done than if you didn't. And these advantages, particularly the low area requirement, um, have driven the conversion of a lot of wind drill composting facilities, on farms included, for aerated static piles because it has those advantages. But with aerated static piles, you have to add some um, energy and engineering. So it's still pretty simple. You have a, a pipe which serves as an air duct hooked to a blower with some control mechanisms that force air into the pile. Now, these photos are from a wastewater treatment plant that composted biosolids, but I could have told you this was a farm and it would have looked realistic. This just could be the inside of a barn. So it's still simple enough to be done on a farm. Um, this particular uh, composter has very simple controls. It's an on and off timer. So the timer spends it some time on to aerate the windrow and cool it off, and some time off to let it rest and do its thing. And uh, the timer settings would be adjusted uh, manually based upon the temperatures of the operator sustaining it. There are more complicated control systems where uh, the, the blower might come on and off based upon temperature feedback. There's, I'm on the There's a temperature sensor in the pile that sends a signal to the controls and turns the blowers on and off. It's still fairly simple. And then there are very sophisticated controls where the, the fan runs continuously and the temperature sensor turns the, the airflow rate up and down. Okay. And this is that same application. So the equipment they use for the blower and um, this loader to build piles and take piles apart. And then they have a mixer, which mixes in the biosolids and wood chip amendments that they use to create the right aeration conditions, the right free air space uh, and bulk density for that pile. And this is just an, an, an auger based turner like many uh, turners on farm, like many mixers, excuse me, this is an auger based mixer, like many on farm mixers that are used to mix uh, feed rations. Yeah. Here's a, a different version of an area static pile. Before we saw individual piles, this is called an extended pile, where each batch of material is built on the side of another to extend the pile, and each batch is called a cell. And the cell may have its own aeration pipe. And you can see here um, one blower is feeding numerous cells through a manifold. Um, so this is on a farm. This is a farm that used to compost by windrows and found the, uh, the advantages of an area that pile will work to conversion. This farm uses um, a fairly durable pipe, it's high density polyethylene pipe. Um, as the duct work um, to avoid damaging the pipe when breaking down the piles, they actually pulled the pipe out using a tractor and chain. This is this is the most common way of, of uh, running areas that are piles now, is with durable pipe that gets pulled out before the piles get broken down. The other option is to have a loader operator who's really good and can avoid the pipe as much as possible. Um, but more and more people are doing this pipe pulling method. Okay. Here's another area static pile. Uh, again, this is farm. Uh, they're composting uh, dewatered dairy manure solids, and they decided to build a building to house the composting system and compost uh, the solids in these bunkers. Uh, the bunkers have a positive aeration system in the floor. Uh, I don't recall whether the, it has pipes on the playing on the floor, floor or uh, an aeration system that's built into the floor, um, but uh, nevertheless, it's a positive aeration system. Air blowing up from the floor through these materials. Here's a picture of the aeration systems on the bottom left: the blowers and the pipe that are feeding each of these uh, uh, bunkers, and each bunker has their own system. Um, that person shining back in the light, um, he's not an angel, although 
for me, he has, his name's Peter Moon. He designed this system. Um, Peter's uh, a very good fellow to know. He, he specializes in aerated uh, static pile systems. And he does, does a lot of his work on farms, helping farms to uh, make an aerated static pile system fit into their farming operation. And he's put a lot of systems on farms uh, all over the country and even outside the country. In fact, this is a Peter Moon uh, design system. Uh, this is a farm that uh, composts yard trimmings from the community and its own farm waste. And it also gets some waste from the ho hotel that it's associated with. Um, it's not a lot, it's not a large scale system. Um, they do this uh, undercover in these bunkers, uh, in this building. Each of these uh, bins holds batch. Uh, there are bins on both sides of the building. And so they have one, two, three, they have about uh, eight to 10 um, of these bays which to work with. Uh, when they're done in the bays, um, the piles sit out and that, the material sits in passive piles to cure. Okay, so a fairly si simple system. Their aerated system looks like this. Um, so you can see the plenum on the bottom left. Um, so the, the air gets, gets uh, delivered into this plenum. It's covered with the slatted boards. Um, air moves up through this, the um, spacing between the boards and up into the floor. The floor is covered with a layer of wood chips to uh, keep vines out of the aeration system and to help distribute the air from the aeration plenum up through the materials. And on the right, you see up um, the shed, the blower shed, uh, where the uh, pipes are directed to the various uh, um, base and also the control system. Yeah, yeah it's a fairly simple control system. Uh, here's another example of an aerated static pile. This one has a little different twist. Uh, for one thing, this is a negative aeration system. Um, so this is continuous bed of dairy cattle manure, mostly from heifers and calves. So it's fairly highly bedded. It doesn't need, need to be mixed with a lot of amendments to have the right quality for composting. And they just build these in strips, okay? And then uh, start aerating them. The air gets pulled down through the bed. And this is what it looks like underneath, okay? The aeration system's in the floor. The floor is covered with, uh, with wooden planks that have holes drilled in it. Beneath the wooden planks in, is a trench an aeration pipe that occasionally delivers or sucks air down through the wooden planks and into a uh, manifold. What's interesting about this system is they use it for heat recovery. So here's the part we've seen, at least uh, in the composting building. The air moves down through the compost and then enters a manifold. That's the blowers on the other side of the manifold. That's what's sucking the air through the compost. And then the blower delivers the air to this heat exchange. Um, this is a, a bulk tank on one end and just a, a large uh, conduit, maybe a foot long of PVC pipe on the other. Uh, the hot air goes in the one end where the conduit is as a gas. There's heat pipes in the middle. Heat pipe has refrigerant in it that the refrigerant evaporates on the hot end and then um, condenses in the bulk tank where it gets cooled down and heats the water in the bulk tank. And then that water is delivered to a uh, floor for facility heating. Um, one farm have used, have used this to heat the floors on their calf beds and you can pull off some hot water out of this. Um, several farms are doing this. There's a company called AgriLab Technologies uh, based in Vermont that is doing a lot of this in farms in New England. Um, they have since moved away from this uh, heat pipe type of heat exchanger and uh, developed others, some that, you, that they're starting to mount on these skids so it can be moved from farm to farm. So uh, an interesting and uh, intriguing twist to Compost. Just another reason to compost is to recover that heat. 
it's not being done a lot, but in some places, uh, why not? So the next method of composting would be within this giant category called contained or in vessel composting systems, where the composting environment is closed within a container or a vessel. Some of these are being done on farms by far. Uh, it's mostly windrows and they are static piles, but there are places for these on certain farms under certain conditions. Okay. Almost all of these are require second stage of composting, that is the vessel is only the first part of composting, where it's most important to have that containment. And almost all are situation where a company's selling this vessel to you and they also support it. But there's at least one example and probably more where it's homemade. On the farm. So this is a farm built enclosed aerated box. You might, it might be called a tunnel or a box composting system in other places. And in this case, it's handling dairy cattle and all. And you can see a picture of the inside on the right. There's positive aeration in the floor. Uh, the air taken out of the headspace is recir recirculated a bit, fed in with some fresh air. What this does give you is a, just a little bit more control, both of odors and the process. I'm not sure on a farm this is justified, um, but this farmer um, felt that he could pull it off by building it himself. And he also wanted to recover the heat. So there's some heat tubes in the top of this vessel, in the top of this tunnel, are just circulating air through the composting space, uh, circulating water through the composting space and picking up some heat and using it to, um, to feed this uh, uh, radiator that blows warm air into their shop across the way. So just another example. Um, this is less an example and just the point that these types of in-vessel systems are called agitated bays. They're like windrows, only they have solid walls and there's an automatic turner that runs through um, without an operator that, that turn the material in these bays and also move it along. It doesn't just turn the material in place, it tends to pick it up and shift it so there's a material handling advantage here. Most of these, when they're on farms, are um, used for poultry manure because um, the poultry manure is a little more difficult to compost because of the odor and high nitrogen content. Um, and in many cases, it's not mended with, with uh, low nitrogen. So some, a lot of this is uh, targeted. Here's a commercial system. Um, okay, it's called an earth flow system by the Green Mountain Technologies Company. Um, this is a small scale, you could call it an agitated bay or an agitated vessel, but um, it's one of its target uses is on horse stables who have um, horse bedding that they want to turn into compost, and this can be done on site. Drums. Uh, drums are another type of in vessel system. Uh, the key thing about drums, it's a very short composting time. Most drums handle material from three to six days and then it goes out. And the advantage of the drum is it gets the process going quickly and it contains the material when it's most odorous. Okay, so here's four examples. All but the one on the upper right-hand side are on farms. The one in the upper right-hand side is at a college. Uh, but again, it could be a farm. Uh, and so they put the materials through quickly and then stack them in windrows or piles or area stack piles to finish the composting, except the one on the bottom left that really is just recycling manure, bedded manure, to recover the bedding and reusing the bedding. So these drums are used in a lot of cases for that. But they're another legitimate and vessel system for farms. Okay, how am I doing on time now, Linda? Um, we've got like six minutes left. Six minutes, okay. Let's talk quickly about the site. Um, the characteristics of the site. So here's a farm, the farmstead's up top, that, that hypothetical situation is looking to, um, to compost on site and they're kind of identified this piece of land as a potential compost area. So what do we need to know to see if this is a, a, a legitimate site or a feasible site or not? Well, we've got to look at 
a couple of things about the site. One is the landscape. Uh, which way does water flow uh, when it falls on the site? In this case, there's sort of a compound slope down in, in each of these directions. Right? So it would be straight down diagonally. Um, other features of the site that you need to identify is which direction is the prevailing wind. I don't I don't put too much importance in the prevailing wind direction in most cases because the wind changes so much in almost every site. It blows from every direction um, often enough that prevailing wind isn't a good predictor of where odors are going to go most of the time. But still, it's good to know. There's a creek near the site. That's important because we can't be too close to that. Residences, very important because that might be uh, odor impacts there. And we wanna know the distances from these things. There are regulations that determine how far at a minimum you need to be from these things. I can tell you those minimum separation distances between a composting site and residence, they're not enough to um, prevent odor impacts to those residences. You need to have good management as well. But these are some of the things you need to identify now. Where's the water? Which way is the land slope? Where are the residences and other, other people that might be impacted? Where's the wind blowing? So this particular creek is about 300 feet from the edge of the composting site. That's not bad. Most regulations would say that's within limits. So it would be buildable. Um, there's a gravel road. Access to a composting site is important. In this case, there's a gravel road that connects the composting site to the farmstead, which is where the materials are gonna come from, mostly manure. So that's another important feature of the site. Um, so when you identify where you're gonna do the things on your site based upon this. Uh, I might mention on this particular site, um, I might discourage this composter from from choosing this site, largely because not how far the residences are from the site, but because few of them are directly downhill. So on, on a cold, clear night where you get a temperature inversion and not much wind, um, you get the condition where air from a, a composting site that might, that might be on a hill or plateau, as this one is, would drain down, downhill, um, and collect in low areas and cause it odor that way. This particular site is susceptible to that because of where the residents are. Uh, and the, the cold, perhaps odorous air could collect in that, uh, in that stream down. So then you can look a little closer and decide what you can do and where you can put things. And, uh, and then from these circle diagrams, which is our way to start, you can start doing a more detailed design, maybe to scale. But those are the features of the site. Again, water is going to be important, um, increasingly important, because water that runs off the working areas is fairly heavily polluted. Um, it has a lot of solids in it, that, um, and so runoff carries a lot of organic matter, has a high VOD level, and could um, become odorous over time. So what you want to do is, first of all, you want to keep clean runoff that would tend to run onto the site from running onto the site. You want to divert it around the site. And that's what these uh, features circled in blue are. They're dikes and berms and channels that are, are uh, intercepting the run on, in this case, and diverting it around the site. And then you want to keep the water that does fall on the site on the site by collecting it and then concentrating it or treating it if necessary necessary. And so you would put it in a pond or an infiltration area, never directly into a stream, because it's fairly strong in organic matter. So you need to capture it, contain it, treat it if necessary, reuse it. That's the best way to do it. Um, but you need to control water on the site. As I said earlier, most of the strength of the water is in, its, um, is in a sediment that it carries. So an easy way to improve the quality of the runoff water is to get sediment out. And that's fairly easy. You can use compost filter socks that are shown up the right-hand corner, or filter berms of compost or wood chips, uh, or 
actually a, a constructed sediment basin to do that. But it's better to keep that, if you're storing water in a pond, it's better to, to take out the, the sediment before it goes in the pond so the pond does, itself doesn't get odorous. Uh, a common question is, do you need a paved site? And I would say really for, for sure, only if the regulations require it. That's rarely required in farm situations, but it might be in some cases. And if regulations don't require it, then probably you don't need a paved site, but it's an advantage to have one. Um, so even though it might be costly, uh, it can be worthwhile. For instance, in this picture, this is you know, what happens in, in the spring when the snow melts around the site, at least on a day like today, um, this operation could work if they have an, an asphalt path. Okay, odor. Uh, uh, odor is going to be a problem. There's a lot of things they can do. Um, for, composting generates odors because materials decompose the compost. That's it's an inherent connection. You know, decomposition, odors are going to be. But you don't necessarily have an odor problem. You don't have an odor problem until the odors are emitted um, and then they travel to someone who's going to. to Objective odor. So there are several stages in an odor, in the anatomy of an odor problem, where a composting facility can intervene um, to lessen that odor and make it acceptable to the neighborhood and community. Um, and one of those is befriending the community. Uh, and others are more um, operational at the composting site. Okay, so here are some. Odor management uh, practices, I'll call it the greatest hits. Uh, isolated site is the best thing you can have. Keep from overloading the site with the organic materials because the more organic, the more materials there are on the site that can generate odor, the stronger the odor can be. Contain or enclose odor sources if necessary. But then there are, there are simpler uh, measures like prompt handling of feedstocks, Follow good composting practices, maintain porosity, um, C to N ratio, moisture content where it should be, and area growth. A few more timely turning. Watch when you turn, not just how often, but turn only when needed, because when turning is done, it's a quick, intense release of odors. Uh, one of my favorite odor control measures, uh, certainly uh, well suited to farm, is you use a bio cover. Okay. The bio cover is nothing other than a layer on top of a pile or a windrow that's generating odors. It's a layer of material, uh, mostly compost or pre compost before it's screened that still has some um, woody material in it. And you just put it on top and it's simple containment. And what happens is the air moving up to the top of the pile is, a, is absorbed and water is condensed in this layer and much of the odor is contained, not all of it, and broken down in this way. So a very simple, uh, underused method of odor control. So I know I went through all that kind of fast. Um, and my six minutes is probably up. If you want more information, uh, the Institute for Local Self-Reliance is having uh, its webinar, and I believe they also have an online course that you can take to learn more about it. I teach um, with uh, my partner, Matt Cotton, a Foundations of Composting class. It's a one-day class. We teach this at the beginning of the US Composting Council Conference every year. Uh, this year, it's in Austin. Um, and I'm sure we'll be teaching on January 4th. That mass man there is Matt um, teaching. If you want even more training, um, there are a number of multi-day hands-on training programs around. Uh, Maine has had one for a long time. I don't know when they're starting theirs up again, but the U.S. Compost, or excuse me, the Compost Research and Education Foundation runs a five-day course um, around different parts of the country, um, and it's been fairly popular. Here's an idea of a curriculum um, for you to get some hands-on training if you'd like. Uh, the composting facility tours are particularly good. That's why I highlighted it. 
Okay, I think I made it within time. So thank you very much. I apologize for rushing through this, um, but that's the time we have. And hopefully I can answer unanswered questions for you now. Yes, exactly. That is what we are going to do. So thank you, Dr. Rank, for a great presentation. Um, we have been collecting some questions as they've been coming in. Um, so starting with a, um, a clarification on the hot stage of composting, the graph that you showed uh, indicated it might take one to nine months for the active composting phase, um, but the person usually hears two to three weeks during that phase before, before it moves into finishing or curing. Any comments on that? If, if you have an, uh, uh, a close to ideal process, um, you can do that in two to three weeks. Um, you, can, you can make compost that is ready to move into the curing phase with an ideal process and suitable feedstocks. But in my experience, uh, in order to get most feedstocks to the point where it can go into the curing pile and just be piled without turning, it takes a lot longer than three, excuse me, three weeks more like two months at a minimum. Again, it depends upon the feedstocks. Slowly composting feedstocks, feedstocks that may have gone through some decomp, some uh, stabilization already, it could work. For example, um, the standard method for composting biosolids, um, which was developed by the USDA at the Bellsco Research Station, sometimes it's called the Bellsco Area Static Pile Method, typically recommended composting under aeration for three weeks and then go to curing for a month. Bios, first of all, biosolids has already been through an anaerobic digestion process, so it's partially stable. But even then, I don't think biosolids can be stabilized in three weeks. I think it needs longer. That's my personal feeling. I think if you're going for three weeks, you're rushing it. But if you're doing that, you need an ideal process, certainly forced aeration, uh, a, a fairly large amount of bulking agent that allows the aeration to be um, evenly distributed, um, and um, the right seed end ratio, and so on. I think three weeks is pushing it. That's great. And that actually leads into another question How do you recommend getting good free airspace? Um, the best way to get free air space is to mix the materials to a bulk density uh, of less than a thousand pounds per cubic yard by adding dry bulking materials. Wood chips would be um, the best, is usually the best choice because they're chunky, they have good structure, they stand up in a pile, um, they don't compress, they don't lose their structure as they decompose. Um, in fact, they go through the composting process almost unchanged. And if you're not using them for mulch, um, you would end up screening them out. But wood chips are the best amendment to pick to mix with other materials to get that free air space. If you don't have wood chips, you can do it with other bulky materials like corn cobs would be great, peanut hulls would be great, um, chopped straw, um, even sawdust, but if you, if you use sawdust, you're going to use a lot of it and probably uh, dry the material out too much more and then add water back. Um, the chunkier material, the better. Wood chips are the standard. Awesome. Uh, there's a question about whether you can make good compost using a large static pile that doesn't get turned much. Um, and is also not actively aerated. Yes, you can make good compost in a large static pile. Um, some people make good compost in very large static piles. Um, I use the term massive passive for those. Um, so what you have to do in that case is wait. Um, the key to making compost when the conditions aren't good, so like in a large pile that isn't aerated much, um, is a wait for time to do its work. So I, I showed that picture where uh, 
passively aerated piles heat up inside and that's the main way to aerate. Well, in large piles, if, if there's not a great deal of airflow through that thermal effect, then you're relying on diffusion. And it's going to take diffusion a while for that oxygen to creep into the, to the pile and uh, and the organisms to uh, decompose the material. So yeah, you can use a large pile um, and you just have to take longer to do it. That in itself is not a problem. The problem with large piles and waiting for them is that it um, greatly increases the risk of spontaneous combustion occurring in the pile. For that reason, I don't recommend it. Um, but I can pretty much say that if you have a large pile of actively decomposing material and you leave it in place without moving it in, within a month or two, um, you're going to get fire, and that could be serious. So, although yes, you can make compost in large piles without forced aeration, um, you're increasing the risk of fire. Great. Okay, and then a uh, question about the bio layer and whether six and say something like six inches of wet straw would work as a bio layer, or any other recommendations for easily removable materials to use as a bio layer? Well, the, once you're making compost, you'll have compost at your disposal to use as a bio layer, and that's the best one. Um, it's better if the compost has some porosity to it that it will allow the, the passive air movement that is already occurring to, to, to continue on through the bio layer. Um, but just finished compost will work, and a six inch Six, four to six inch layer will do of that. Um, if you if you have a screen, and screen overs will work pretty well. Um, my next suggestion would be a mixture of compost and wood chips. Um, next after that would be just wood chips. Uh, straw would work. The problem with straw is, is it, tends, it becomes matted down when it gets wet, and it can become a barrier to aeration. Um, so that would be the problem with straw. But it, I think as a containment me mechanism, it would, it would contain odors. It would just um, make the aeration condition within the pile worse. Chopped straw would be better than unchops. Awesome, thank you for all those options. Uh, and the last question that I'm gonna ask before we do some final polling and close things up, uh, I think is an important one. It's about uh, curing is always discussed um as an important phase of composting but what's the actual downside if any of spreading a pile of, on the field that is not completely cured um the downside of spreading material that is not completely cured is that um it has it still has um some compounds the compost still has some compounds um that are phytotoxic that that would hurt hurt the plants. But if you're merely spreading compost on top of a of a, um, a field, let's say during the fall or winter or um, onto a fallow field, uh, it shouldn't be a problem. So um, that's where I said the intended use of the compost is important. In fact, if you're spreading compost on the field, um, maybe stability is not that important at all. And you can cut it short. You don't even have to cure it. Uh, it depends entirely on its use. If you're putting compost into a potting media, it has to be very stable. If you're uh, incorporating compost into a garden, it has to be fairly stable. But spreading it on a field, especially when um, the field is not growing anything at the moment, fine. Go ahead and do it. Saving yourself time and money. Awesome. So I'm going to call it there with the questions, but thank you all for submitting them. And um, I hope that some of the other ones that you all submitted will be answered in fu future sessions. Uh, but before we go, uh, just a few more quick polls. First one being, as an overview of the fundamentals of on-farm composting, this webinar had too much information the right amount of information or not enough information. Giving you all just a few more seconds. All 
Alrighty. It's always good to see this. That a vast majority say the right of amount of information. So thank you, Dr. Rink, for doing that. Um, next question. Uh, are there any questions that this presentation that were not answered by this presentation? Any questions you had about on-farm composting fundamentals? I realize that it often takes some time to digest this information before you realize what questions you still have. So hopefully uh, you all will get some answered in future sessions as well. Okay, a couple more seconds. So we're pretty even, pretty split, um, but majority says no. Great. Uh, we are considering doing like a live Q and A at some point. Um, if that's of interest, let us know. Uh, Invite back some of the, the presenters from the series. So let us know if that's of interest. Final question: um, Do you plan to participate in any of the other webinars in this series? Yes, no, maybe. Couple more seconds. All right, vast majority says yes, say yes. And that's fab fabulous for us to know. And we're so glad uh, the series is designed to sort of build over time. Um, and hopefully we'll get to answer all of those questions, the burning questions you have about on-farm composting and compost use. So thank you so much, Dr. Rink, uh, for your great presentation. And thank you all for participating. And we'll look forward to seeing you at the next webinar. Okay, thank you all.